everyone. Um, and thanks to Layla and Rachel for setting up um, the biosimilars program so nicely for me. I'm going to pick up some of the topics that Rachel kind of touched on um, in terms of the quality data in my talk. Um, so we'll just go ahead. Um, it was surprising that I didn't see this disclaimer before, but um, basically don't take the information in the, these slides to be used in place of um, published guidances, the regulations, and interactions with the agency for your specific product. And the case studies um, that I'm going to be presenting today may be hypothetical. So some things that um, I'm going to talk about today um, and hopefully you, you take away today are that um, there's a need for a strong comparative analytical assessment for biosimilar products. Um, we'll talk about the key points for how to perform a strong um, assessment. And then um, I'll go over some recent updates to um, the FDA guidance that Layla talked about earlier. Um, and most of these updates were included to clarify expectations, but uh, most of them don't introduce new expectations. So um, you guys have all seen this pyramid before. There's this stepwise approach. Um, the biggest part of the pyramid is the analytical component, um, and it helps shape and customize the rest of the, um, the development program. So um, you need a solid foundation of made of solid data. So um, what you want to ask is, can you rely on your comparative analytical data in your BLA to hold up this pyramid? And how do we go about building a strong foundation? The number one thing is understanding the reference product and its qu critical quality attributes. Um, and um, another part of building a strong foundation is making sure you select your lots appropriately. So for the reference product, the goal there is to understand product variability and, and um, the number of lots that you include and the time frame and all those things. Um, you want to have a sufficient number to understand product variability. For your own product, you want to um, analyze your uh, investigational and commercial lots to see what they look like. Um, and for method selection, um, you want to include sufficient methods to adequately characterize a product. Um, you're going to want to include orthogonal methods and adequately qualified methods. And um, another really important piece is to make sure that you have adequate documentation and traceability for all your data. Um, so the comparative analytical assessment includes assessment of a lot of different characteristics. Um, people will use a lot of different assays um, to, um, to build the assessment. But um, what's important is that all the quality attributes will be used to define the identity, purity, potency, and stability of, your, of um, the product. And if these attributes are critical, they'll also correlate with safety and efficacy. So understanding the relationship between your quality attributes and the um, clinical safety and efficacy profile will then help you understand if there is residual uncertainty about biosimilarity. So um, how do we make sure that our analytical methods are adequately qualified? So you're going to need to begin with a basic understanding of the method, like what are you trying to look for and what's the best way to look for it? Um, and then next you want to understand um, again, the purpose of the method, and that helps you inform how you'll design your qualification study. So, um, um, again, what is the method going to be used for? Are you going to be quantifying a critical quality attribute? Um, do you want to use this method to reduce residual uncertainty? Do you want to use it to confirm a result of another method? Um, next thing will be to evaluate the method capabilities and limitations. Um, what is the specificity, precision, accuracy of the method? How sensitive, sensitive is the method? What are critical reagents um, that are used that might impact performance of the method? Um, and then next, you're going to qualify the method. And here, you um, would want to establish system suitability parameters that ensure adequate performance every time you run the method. And you really want to make sure that you document the qualification results, because that will help support um, your data later on. 
Um, and then lastly, you'll establish an adequate method protocol. And the protocol should include sufficient detail to ensure consistent performance by trained analysts. And you should also document the analyst training. Okay, so case study number one is about method qualification. Um, for this particular product, the literature shows that method, method methionine oxidation of 10% can impact um, binding. So you run some um, peptide mapping, and you see in your product 15% oxidation. In the reference product, you have 5% oxidation. And you go back and you look at your method qualification data. Um, and um, those are summarized here. So the challenge question is, um, based on the method qualification data, can you make a conclusion on if you have a problem um, with your um, biosimilar product? It's a yes or no answer. So what do you guys think? Can you make a conclusion? No. The answer is no. It's unclear if the method is suitable or if the samples that were tested um, are suitable for the qualification exercise. So you can see the positive and the negative control kind of look the same. And then these samples are, are supposed to have different levels of oxidation kind of look the same. So we can't really tell at this point if it's the samples or the method. And actually, this brings up a good point that like before you actually even get to the point where you start testing um, your samples, you really need to understand your method and make sure that you have the best method. And, and um, better development up front would have um, stopped this from happening at the point where you have started uh, testing your samples. So a little bit about data integrity. There's a FDA guidance that talks about data integrity. Um, and that's in the context of GMP sites for um, the analytical, the comparative analytical assessment. You don't necessarily have to run these um, assessments in a GMP lab. But some of the principles that are outlined in this guideline um, should be considered when you're um, collecting your data. So your data should be attributable, so traceable to the individual that tested the samples, legible. Um, of course, you want to be able to understand what happened. Contemporous, um, documenting results at the time they occurred. Um, you want to have true copies of the data. And of course, you want the data to be accurate. So case study two is about traceability of data. Let's say you did some um, of your comparative assessment on HPLC instrument X. And then you buy a new HPLC instrument. Um, HPLC X was then taken apart, deconditioned. Um, but you didn't back up data from um, the old HPLC. And the raw data is nowhere to be found. So the outcome is there is no way to verify the data in the submission. So the challenge question is what went wrong here? A, nothing, because the data were acquired in a non-GMP lab. Um, so you didn't really need to have backups and um, those other things. Or B, the firm should have backed up the data to ensure um, they're accurate, complete, and secure from inadvertent erasures or loss. What do you guys think? Yeah. OK, so moving on to the updates and the guidance. Um, and Rachel talked a little bit about reference standards, so I'll go a little bit more quickly through, um, through this part. But the um, guidance updates includes an emphasis on reference standards and talks about the use of in-house reference standards and that um, you, should be, um, you should be using a primary reference um, standard and a secondary reference standard, basically a two-tier system. Um, that's the, the best way to ensure um, that your data can be linked over time. So um, the guidance also says that you can use um, a non-US licensed comparator product or the reference product as an early um, stage reference standard in the beginning. Rachel kind of talked about that too. But eventually, you want to move again to an in-house reference standard system, because that will give you better control, um, because you're actually making the reference standard then. And so case study three is about reference standard qualification. Um, so here, you can see that this um, company had a lot of different 
reference standards that they made during development and then also into the commercial phase. So how do we, how do all these reference standards relate? And are we going to be able to compare data from all the different stages of development? Um, we can if you have adequate reference standard qualification and bridging data um, to link all the reference standards. So it, it helps me to think about things a little bit visually. So let's say um, you have three reference standards over time and you're measuring the CQA. And you're just getting, let's say, release results, right? And that's in blue. Um, your reference standard looks pretty, um, or your relative potency looks pretty good. It's, it's not trending up or down or anything. But you look at um, actual qualification data for the reference standard, and it's, um, the reference standards are a little bit different from one another. So what that means is the actual results you're getting here are, not, are are not real because your reference standards, you, you were testing with, with reference standards that you didn't really understand how they related with each other. So that's bad. <laughs> so um, um, again, another note about adequately qualified reference standards and how they prevent drift is let's say um, you have three different reference standards and you, um, in different points in time, you had a, a change in the way you qualified your potency. Um, Rachel talked about this, that um, it's, it's not OK then to apply a correction factor to overcome you know, what looks like differences in your reference standard. So um, if the agency sees inadequately qualified reference standard, this may raise concerns regarding your comparative analytical assessment. So um, you should consider storing lots of um, everything you have, the proposed product, the reference product, and if you're using a non-US licensed comparator product, as well as your reference standards at applicable, um, as applicable at appropriate conditions, so that if you need to go back and retest, you have all the samples to do that. Okay. So, and then there's also a new section in the guidance that talks about more about the comparative analytical assessment. And um, one of the sections talks about considerations for the reference product and the biosimilar product. And um, we already talked about this first point, that you want to understand the reference product and the observed lot-to-lot -lot variability in the reference products. So um, the guidance says that you'll, you need to have a sufficient number of lots to inform on variability. And um, what, we've, what we state in the guidance is that this means at least 10 reference product lots and at least six to 10 representative in independent lots of the proposed product. For your product, it might be a little bit more or a little bit less, and um, the conversation is always open, but the, um, these are the recommendations and the guidance. Um, you also want to account for all lots of the reference product that you acquired and bought, and then all the proposed product lots that you manufactured. Um, and everything that you characterize. So you want to justify, let's say you bought some um, reference product lots, but you never tested them. So you should have a justification for that, um, or the same with your own product lots. Um, you should also keep track of dates of testing and product expiration dates. Um, and we'll consider that when we're looking at um, your data. If you're using a non-US licensed comparator, um, you'll need additional analytical data um, for pairwise comparisons. And it's not acceptable to combine data from the reference product and the non-US comparator in order to perform the comparative assessment. Um, some other considerations for data analysis. Um, you're going to start by identifying quality attributes and rank them according to risk. So, um, when you're ranking them according to risk, you want to think about the degree of uncertainties um, around a particular attribute and its potential to impact clinical performance. Um, and then next, you'll evaluate the quality attributes. Um, and there are, there's additional explanation in the guidance on how to do that. But um, you're basically going to split up your 
assessment into a quantitative, quantitative analyses or qualitative analyses. For the quantitative analysis, um, the guidance talks about one particular approach where you use quality ranges for high to moderate risk um, quality attributes. And we recommend a narrower uh, quality range acceptance criteria for higher risk um, quality attributes. Um, Tolerance intervals are not recommended, and equivalence testing is no longer recommended. That one is a new point. Um, for the qualitative analysis, um, it's acceptable to use raw data or graphical comparisons for attributes with the lowest risk ranking or those that can't be quantitatively measured. Um, and these data should be presented side by side to facil facilitate review. And um, I just wanted to thank everyone that helped me put my slides together and um, gave me some pointers on, on how to fix things. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it is time.